Hello everyone and welcome to This Is Why We Fight. I'm Jo. And I'm Jordan. Good evening and uh, we hope you're doing very well. Uh, we want to talk about welfare uh, this evening and while it might seem like a convenient safety net for people and, and I want to expand welfare to cover everyone who's been forced onto universal credit in the last 12 months. We got to talking uh, the other Does night. It Sorry, does it apply to people who've been forced onto it? Well, it's still welfare. You were still in receipt of uh, okay, fair enough, fair enough. Uh, uh, taxpayer-funded state handouts, I suppose, even though we've been prevented from earning our own money and, and we've been literally left no choice. Um, yeah, I see it kind of as a debt payment. I say not debt payment, a guilt payment from the government. Well, maybe, but the government has no money, so I still see it as wasting taxpayer money. Um, so basically, if you've worked in the last 12 months, you're now paying yourself <laughs> not to work because the government won't let you. Amazing. Uh, but anyway, Jordan and I were talking the other night about welfare. And um, for many of us who've been forced onto welfare, um, whatever form it may take, we were talking about what would happen if a void was created, if welfare just disappeared overnight, mm. if it was abolished or if the money ran out, you know, whatever it may be. And then we thought, well, what would happen if there was no welfare? How would we manage? What would we do? And of course, if there was no welfare, that would be because there was um, a massive reduction in state interference. And then we thought, well, maybe what we could do is anything we want. And that's what we're going to talk about. So, Jordan, anything we want. So what is welfare designed to do in, in the modern age? And what could we do without it? Well, on the surface, it's designed to act as a safety net so that people who, for whatever reason, cannot work are able to survive. Right. The problem is, in reality, as we all know, it costs money. That money has to be extracted by force from the productive element of society. The problem then is you've got an increased cost for everybody else as well as opportunity cost. So there's always going to be a band of people in the middle, or not in the middle, but you know, there's always going to be a certain band of people who, if there was no welfare, would be able to make a living, and with welfare cannot, because their jobs simply aren't value, valued enough. So for example, if you're an employee, you have to pay national employer rather, then you have to pay national insurance, suddenly you're you're looking at that job and you're thinking, hey, you know what, I don't actually need that because that extra 79.5% that I'm being made to pay, not worth it for me, I'll just do without that person. So you think this is pure sort of nanny statism, don't you? Oh, to, yes, I despise it. To I've keep always people, despised it. To keep people reliant on the state to get by. Mm -hmm. But one of my biggest issues with it is it takes the voluntary sector out of it completely. Society has always had people who have been unable to work. Admittedly, in times gone by, they've not always been treated the best. That's fine. Do we think we are those same people? Or do we think we have kind of evolved beyond that, philosophically? I, I think we have. Yeah, that's arguably the, we have. Yeah, that's why the welfare state is there, because we've got together somewhat collectively and said, this is a problem, something needs to be done about it. Well, this comes and back to communities, doesn't it? Is that unfortunately the government has put its dirty little fingers in it? The, the left is specifically, and politicians love the welfare state. Nothing makes them happier because it's a free vote. If you vote for me, I'm going to give you more money. Free money. Free. Money. free money. You don't have to do anything. It's wonderful. I mean, it's not and free. And all they need to do every now and then is kick up a fuss. Typically, when they're out of power, about the debt, and so well, look at this. Reckless government spending. You need to vote for us. We're going to give you more money, yet we're going to reduce the, the debt. All is magic. Yes, we're going, to, we're going to have a pop at this lot for, for their increased spending. But if you vote for us, we're going to give you more and more money. Free yeah. money. It's it, That magic word, it's free. sort of money. Money that you don't have to do anything in order to get. Money that you are just entitled to. And this really comes down to entitlement. And I know that most people in receipt of welfare are there. Unwillingly. Yes. And for them, it's very much a short term safety net, as it's designed to be. Mm -hmm. 
but we also know uh, unfortunately that there are people who have taken <laughs> welfare lifestyles as a, a permanent choice yeah, but that's because the government allows it it's because they encourage it things like single motherhood for example that is not something that would naturally happen. You're not going to get a, a 16, 17 year old girl go out deliberately get pregnant without being married, and then just live off the state. I would that argue would never as well. Have happened. Do you, do you think that? Well, I certainly do. Uh, so the question would actually be: Do you agree with me that there would be fewer divorces? I think, if not for the fact that women were able to keep the home and claim welfare. Yes, of course. Um, if if women had to rely solely on the money that they were the alimony they were to receive in a divorce settlement, essentially um, eating into their partner ex partner husband's uh, wages while he has to pay for another property, mm -hmm. um, if it was if it was the kind of salary or income that you would expect it to be, I think a lot of women might potentially try harder to make the relationship work i mean there obviously there are um there are, always uh, cases for uh, everybody. there are unforgivable acts yes. that you should not forgive but I, I i do suspect a lot of divorces occur because it's so much easier to live apart than it is sometimes to live together mm -hmm. um you know tax breaks for couples are notwithstanding it's actually a lot easier for people to or at least for one of them to claim welfare and the other one to work and contribute and top up the income. Mm -hmm. um, but this is state interference again. And we were yeah, talking... I don't... Go on. Sorry, Gal. I, I was just going to say, don't ever confuse... I actually lost my train of thought as I interrupted. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, you didn't give me much to prompt you with either. Don't ever confuse something and something. Um... I mean, I know that there was a period during the 80s and 90s where young girls were encouraged to... Not encouraged. Let's say that the financial incentives were there for young girls to get pregnant, mm -hmm. uh, to move away from home, to go and apply to the council, and to get their own property. Uh, obviously, they won't own it. It's rented. It's council stock or, or um, social housing, let's say. Um, but they would be paid a full range of benefits to raise a child alone. Um, the father, by definition, I know that there have obviously been <laughs> moves to make uh, absent fathers, uh, and not just absent fathers, by the way, absent parents, uh, pay for the upkeep of their children, as it should be. Ideally, that child would be raised by two parents, uh, one of each sex, just for clarification, um, but there is very much a financial incentive. Uh, I don't know about now. It's certainly there was in the last decade to raise a child as a single parent. Mm -hmm. Um, people who were raising their children working, I don't know, couples working 30 hours a week each, barely getting by just enough, you know, to put food on the table, pay the bills, nothing left, no holidays. Uh, no car, uh, no savings, just, just barely scraping through. We're actually paying other people <laughs> to stay at home and raise children alone. This is another prime example of things like school and nursery. This is basically all state intervention is. It's taking money from Peter to pay Paul. It's completely bloody stupid. You have people who... I actually know somebody for, for this this example. Uh, she has two kids, and she's spent the last what was it, eight years working purely to put them through nursery. That was it. That, that was all her money was going mm -hmm. towards. Her husband was paying for everything else, you know, the car, the holiday, whatever else, all the kids' clothing, all of that stuff. Her job was simply to send the kids to nursery. What is the point well we there don't... is no point in that that is stupid that we... is asinine you are working to pay somebody else to do what you could be doing and you'd be doing a better job at 
Well, that, that just... is the point, isn't it? But, uh, you get allocated uh, so many hours a week, depending on mm. how many hours you work. Um, but yeah, so I just want to pick up on that point. If you're working a, a 30 or 40 hour a week, in order to pay someone else to raise your children, what are you doing? Exactly, it's bloody stupid. You're paying you a see... stranger. And this is the example of, of socialism in general. You're working, you're paying stuff. Yeah, except the goods it... that you're sharing out now are your children. Why would, you saying, trust, why would you trust your children with a complete stranger? Who can possibly give them a better start in life than their own parents? And be because trust... they have the certification from the government to say that they're more competent than you to raise your children. <laughs> are you talking about registered childminders? Yes. Registered childminders. Um, I, 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 I don't actually have a bad thing to say about them, but... These are usually women who haven't children of their own. How are they more competent than you? Because they have a degree that says they are. This is more theory nonsense, not practical experience theory. This, this is a qualification gained in a classroom. Even, I mean, even if it was practical experience, even if they were mothers, the reality is they are not the mother of your child, thereby pretty damn irrelevant. Well, they're not going to care about the things that you care about. Exactly. This is not a long-term investment for them. This is a job. This is, a, this is simply money. This is simply money, and there is basically no difference between them doing that job and sweeping the streets. I can't imagine, as a mother myself, a time ever when I'd come home from work and hear my children calling my childminder mum. I can't imagine what they must feel like. But children generally bond with the female, or, or rather the primary caregiver. I know women who have had childminders from their children being six months old. Let's say six months. I know some that have gone back to work when their children were much younger than that. Imagine just for a moment that your child is bonding with your child carer. And not you. What are you? What are you? A factory? What? What are you doing? You're a broodmare. You're you're producing children for someone else to raise. Everything you earn pays their wages. You 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 you, sorry, could, you, you, you work in order to pay for them to do what you could be doing, and you work in order to pay for them to live their own lives as well. Well, they basically have all the benefits of housewifery. Mm -hmm. um, except they don't do the laundry or the washing up. They, in, in many cases, the child is dropped off with a childminder. They so, get all the fun stuff. So they get paid to basically be in their own homes all day long. While you go out and work, probably doing a job you hate. So that they can be at home with your child in their home, instead of you being at home with your child in your home, raising your child properly, teaching it the things you want it to learn. And then when your child turns five, you palm it off on the school. And that's more childcare, only this time the state's doing it. What is the point of having a child if you're not going to raise it yourself? Exactly. Welfare is, is the point. Well, this is why... Go on. As I was saying... <laughs> this is why we focus quite a lot on things that people can do to make money themselves yes because there are lots of women who go out to work and do jobs they hate to pay someone else to raise their children and what we want to do is focus on the things that women can do at home if you must have two incomes and, and in many cases that, that is a must and we're not judging anyone for that wouldn't it be lovely if one of those parents could work from home and be there for their children. And ideally homeschool them. Um, but not necessarily. Um, hopefully, you know, once we get these communities set up, we'll have the village school. Where we can have a handful of people homeschooling groups of children so that both parents can work. It would still be nice, though, if one of the parents could work from home. So they're always mm -hmm. available when there's an emergency. 
if your child is silly enough to have an accident at school and, and kids are a bit rambunctious and, you know, th these things happen, um, you want to make sure that your child, uh, sorry, that you can be reached in an emergency and that your child can receive the best care and that you know about it and not after the fact. Imagine how you'd feel knowing your child had been taken to hospital by, say, a teacher um, because you were unavailable. This also comes back to the fact that um, yeah, I don't want to talk about the wage gap. Nonsense. That's all I've got to say on that. But the reality is employers are going to be more reluctant to employ women because they are going to be more likely, as the primary caregiver in most cases, to need time off when their children are poorly. Somebody has to be at home when your children are poorly, right? And the primary caregiver is usually the one who it is. Um... It, it has always uh, traditionally been majority of women that are the primary caregiver. So when I see stories about employers getting in the neck for being reluctant to employ women, I totally understand where they're coming from. And I say this as a mother. Because if I was working and my child was ill, I would absolutely put my child first, no question. But this comes back to welfare. If you are in receipt of welfare and you are raising children, there are many reasons for it. You could be widowed. Um, but it's still very restrictive because there are certain things you can and can't do where you're in receipt of welfare. This is big brother watching you once again. Um, but if you weren't in receipt of welfare, what would you do? Well, let's talk about the things people can do. Instead but of one, just, just getting back to something you mentioned that was quite interesting about employers employing or tending not to employ women because or women rather because of well mothers needing to off. yeah well whatever even so maybe the table needs to be turned on them a little bit maybe we should start phrasing it more in the perspective that men need a job because they need to support their family well yes i absolutely agree but what i'm saying is that that women no 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 i i understand i'm talking about something completely different I'm saying that maybe that's something that should be put towards employers. You know, maybe the pressure should be applied to them so they start employing men over women because men have to support women. Yeah, well, unfortunately, this is the chicken or the egg, isn't it? It kind of is. But it, it's an interesting option, maybe. Yes, I anyway, agree. Um, so, yeah, so... So if there was no welfare, what would women do? What would the primary caregiver do? The parent who chooses to raise the children. And, and I'm not going to make any bones about this. Relationships have broken down. We do not live in a perfect world. And a lot of people are raising children separate from the mother or father of their children. I'm not going to go with a generic uh, stereotype of it's women who stay home and men are basically just wandering off after they impregnate someone. That's not always the case. And I think more and more men now are raising children without their wife or their partner. Um, but for the sake of this argument, we're going to go with mothers and fathers and the stereotypes. It's much easier and faster to give examples. Um, so if you are a mother and you have been widowed or abandoned or divorced or whatever. If, if you're on the... The unlucky side, basically. Well, it's that's that's down to your perspective. I I think staying with the children can be deemed lucky, depending on who you are. Um, but if you're not the one who walked away, you have a massive responsibility. It's very easy to fall back on the state. Um, you could say to to be there for your children. A lot of people claim welfare so they don't have to work, or rather, sorry, no receiving welfare means they don't have to work and they can be there to raise their children except when your children are at school then what um think about all the restrictions a anytime the state gives you something that there's a condition and what we're saying is if there was no welfare there would be no state interference you would be free to raise your children as you see fit but how would you earn money there are a lot of single parents who are struggling to get by, who are reliant on the state. We want to look at alternatives to the state. 
those alternatives would ultimately give you freedom. And if there was no state and no welfare, what would you be able to do? And we were talking about this, weren't we? And we were saying, well, you know, going back to the sort of children in America in the 50s, and I suspect in Britain as well, you could open something like a lemonade stand. You wouldn't need a, a license to operate. You wouldn't need to fill out paperwork. You could just make something and sell it. And I wonder if this kind of nanny state welfare lifestyle has actually arisen because of the restrictions. How many people have wanted to start a business, for instance? And there's all restrictions on tenancies now that you can't run a business from your home. You need to register your business. You need a business bank account and so on and so forth. You need, you need a license for this and a license for that. But if we had communities, um, would any of those things be necessary? Would they matter? The other aspect of that, the, the insidious nature of taxes, is because there's so much welfare, because there's so many government programs for this, that and the other, many of which are things that aren't actually available to members of the public. They're purely you know, council things. The, the council wants to install a new streetlight, for example. Well, we need a fund for that. And they, they get millions for this sort of absolute rubbish. <laughs> that comes out of our pockets at the end of the day. Yes, it does. That comes out of thing, that comes out of us via income tax, via VAT, via national insurance, both insurance that you're paying as well as the 17.5% that your employers are paying. That also comes out of your uh, council tax and your rates if you're a business. Well, well, things like the rates are incredibly bloody crippling because you could go along somewhere. I, I, I'm in this position right now. I've spent most of my adult life in this position. You can go, you can get a warehouse unit, you can start working out of there. You can't afford the rates because the rates are half of whatever the government deems your particular thing to be worth, your, your industrial unit to be worth. There is an industrial unit. I, I will always bring this up as an example. Anyone who's been around the M25 would have noticed it or seen this. At, uh, I think it's the Waltham Cross Junction, there used to be a massive, massive warehouse on one side that was the old Sainsbury's depot. Sainsbury's left, and for about four or five years, it was empty. And I kept an eye on this thing, and you could see over the course of time the rates, the rent came down rather. At the same time, the rates, the rateable value, what the government deemed it to be worth, went up to the extent that by the end of it, the rates were worth about 120% of what the rate, the rent was worth. It was absolutely insane. It's only couple of years ago i think that tesco took it over and without a doubt tesco took it over at an absolute bloody steal because of the absurdity that that situation was the the reason i bring this up is because the rates are pushing up rent to such an extent because if you can afford to pay you know, ten thousand a year to rent the building and the government say well you can afford to pay that you can then obviously afford to pay us five thousand the person who owns that building, or the company who owns that building, is then going to look at that and say, well, you're paying out 15000 a year on this. You're only paying us ten next year, or next time the contract is up. You can afford to pay us eleven and a half. And it's slowly, slowly, the prices get pushed up and up and up that way. That is another thing that they do. This it goes back to the, the main problem with taxes. It is the lost opportunity. Because you've got a building which is worth whatever, 10, 15 years later, it's going to be worth three, four times as much as it was purely because of the the spiral that the taxes and the rates get into. So the taxes and the rent get into. Plus, I suspect that any um, uh, improvements you've made to the building won't get taken into account. No, of course not. If anything, you're actually punished for them. Uh, industrial tax in this country is an absolute joke. You pay industrial taxes on this. They're different to rates. They are not the same thing. Um, I'm not an accountant, so this is slightly out of my depth. But from my understanding, what I've looked into when I was researching another industry, one of the main issues with steelworks in this country is the industrial tax that they're forced to pay. 
because they check, tax you not only on the land, but on all improvements made. So How you imagine that? what? It's it's absolutely ridiculous. So the this more money you invest in a building, the more it costs you to rent it. it. Exactly. Now you've got it, Joe. That's ridiculous. Yeah. It's absolutely. You should ridiculous. get a rebate if you've improved the building. Absolutely, but you don't. You're punished for it. This is why our steel industry still uses technology from the forties. Uh, the best description of the, the steel, steel industry, industry you've Do ever heard. We still heard. have one. Well, you know, we have like three plants, I believe. The, the best description I've ever heard of it is the British steel industry is the most advanced industry in the world if we was in 1941. Yeah, I was going to say, cause, like, because our industry so was sold to the Germans, wasn't it? Well, no, it was just bought up by the government and then left to rot. Okay. And then they've sold it, sold it and sold but it. But European sold steel it. is German now, isn't it? And British steel has been basically fallen by the wayside. There's um, been no investment. To extent. Spain produces a lot, but that's beside the point. Um, th th this is one of the problems with it. People keep pushing for more government help and more go more for government to do certain things, like the, the streetlights and complete nonsense like that, improving parks. But Once upon a time, if you wanted a park improved, you bloody well did it. You didn't say, oh, the government should be paying for this. Well, no, go get a shovel, go do whatever well, you need to do. Well, this is what community is for, because the more government help you receive, the more government oversight there is, right? Exactly. And, and you're just courting Big Brother at this point mm -hmm. by asking Look, for help. What's the name of the, the, the cemetery where Marx is buried? Oh, God, I can't remember. Um, Highgate. Highgate Cemetery, yes. Highgate, right. It's a slight detail, but kind of relevant to this. Back in the annals of time, I'm not sure when, the the cemetery was in absolute rack and ruins because the original people who owned it, it wasn't the government, oddly enough, it was a private cemetery. <laughs> uh, they, they not just, for long. Well, no, they, they left it alone and they didn't do anything with it and the place was abandoned. And I think in the 60s, I, I don't know, this, this little group started up known as the Friends of Highgate Cemetery. And they, <laughs> it's kind of an ironic title, but they, they would they would do exactly what we advocate for. They would go in, they'd clean the place up, they'd, they'd tidy it up, they'd make it look nicer. And over the years, it took them an age to do it, but over the years, they gathered up enough money where they were then able to buy it. I think they bought it in the early 90s, I have no idea. Were they, were they, they, were they, they Friends they of Highgate Cemetery or Friends of Karl Marx? Well... <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 that's up for debate. But Small even C. So, okay. Even so, they, yeah, that's what people did. They didn't just look to the government to fix these things. Admittedly, that is not terribly, that is not the distant past by any stretch of the imagination. That is a very, very recent example. But it's the sort of thing that should be our default option. We need something done, we should do it ourselves. Not, we need something done, we need the government to do it. It's a good analogy, though, isn't it? Because this reliance on the government is really the cause of all our, all our pain, all our ills. Mm -hmm. um, government overreach and oversight is the reason why we are currently facing the most tyrannical legislation in our, in our peacetime history. Mm-hmm. Because communities that once took care of each other. This really comes back to the welfare state and taking care of people who have fallen on hard times. Mm -hmm. Communities used to look out for these people. Yeah, but now there are no communities. And you were because talking, they've shipped away. Because yeah. they've taken care of them. Because you were talking about the sort of uh, voluntary nature of contributions. Charity. Charities, I know, used to be religious in this country. Mm -hmm. um, but they used to rely completely on donations. And uh, the religion aspect aside, the fact is that the welfare state almost implies that people would not be charitable unless they were forced to. Yeah, this is one of my biggest issues with socialism. If, if not, this is my biggest issue with socialism. It is the, the immediate assumption that people are absolute garbage. I wouldn't do anything to help anybody else if it wasn't for the government coming along, putting a gun at their head and saying, give us your money so we can do it for you. 
Well, isn't that the it's definition of, cha- uh, of welfare now? It's charity by force. That's always been the definition of welfare. That's what it has always been. But the, the, the biggest issue we have now is we've gotten into this horrible situation whereby we actually rely on it. They're taking so much of our money. They're taking so much of our opportunity that we are reliant on them to continue providing the service. Well, this comes back to the fact that most people are living on a week-to-week or month-to-month basis. Because you are being taxed to high heaven, people don't have savings. They don't have rainy day funds. Mm -hmm. So when you lose your job or you fall on hard times, you almost immediately go into go for welfare. Absolutely. That's exactly what happened to me. So, so I didn't have any other options. So in effect, the they government are forcing this. To work and then that's it. So the government are forcing this. They're putting you in a financial position where you cannot afford to refuse welfare. Because of the amount they are taxing you, because of the amount of red tape and bureaucracy that it takes to start a business. Uh, I mean, you and I have looked into various things that we could do for our community. And the licensing and the cost... It's pretty much it's a closed circuit for everyone who's not already a part of it, right? Which, which is why I was so incredibly passionate when talking about business rates, which is the most boring subject on planet Earth. <laughs> it pretty much is. If, if we've got any latent accountants uh, in the chat, you might be interested in this subject. But honestly, for me, it's no, like... No, I think it is. Um, it's important to know, though, because I think a lot of people don't realise how expensive it is to own a shop. They think, oh, you know, you own a shop, you pay the rent. Well, what's the rent? Oh, okay, I'll go look that up. Oh, that rent's a bit expensive, and then that's as far as they think. They don't then think that, you know, rates are typically around about 50%. Around my area, they're 51.2%. And in fact, There's somewhere in there, actually, somewhere in, in Cambridge, it is 53%. And did we not read that all the businesses that have been forced closed uh, over the last year... Didn't they apply for a rent rebate? Uh, sorry, that's incorrect. A rates rebate, mm-hmm. and they were refused. Many of them, yes. So, for one reason or So even though they've not been open for trade and they've not earned any money, they're still going to pay the rates that are due yeah. on their premises. Yeah, because the, the rates, theoretically, the rates are there for the exact same purpose as council tax. They're there to clean the bins, empty the bins, and run basic council services. <laughs> <laughs> the problem is... There are no council like services Bedford. right now. Bedford, about 10 years ago, they built this massive, massive bloody council building. It cost them about 1.4 billion quid. It's enormous. It's absolutely inexcusable. I've driven past it many times before. I promise you now... This car park probably has about, a th- well, I'm not going to say a thousand spaces, probably over 500 spaces. If you see more than 30 cars in there, you're blown away. It's like, bloody hell, the boss must be in today. This, this building genuinely looks empty. There's the exact same thing going on in Tower Hamlets. They've recently bought up a new bloody office block. Massive thing opposite the, um, opposite the airport. No reason for it whatsoever. They're doing this. If they've done this in two councils that I know of, doubtless they've done this in hundreds of others across the country, just spent money for the sake of spending money, put people in there for the sake of high unemployment, we need to do something quick, let's do it this way. Well, let's talk about the future of welfare. We know... Get rid of it. That a lot of, <laughs> we know that a lot of people are going to be justifiably angry that when the government started these lockdowns, they knew that there would be increased taxes to cover the cost. Mm -hmm. We know that while people have been under stay-at-home orders, the borders have been wide open and the government have allowed so many people to enter the country. Mm -hmm. Knowing that the people still capable of paying taxes would have to pay for these people that they've added in the last year. Mm -hmm. What is the future uh, of welfare, do you think? And... How is that going to work for the average man or woman? I genuinely have no idea. I can see taxes going up a lot. The inflation's already biting in. Wood has become unbelievably expensive. But I with, complained about this on Saturday's live stream. But with a, yeah. with a two trillion pound debt, do you think welfare will continue for the foreseeable yes, future? because money to them is free. It doesn't matter. It's irrelevant. Well, it's, this but is money taken by force, right? So yeah, well, it's not it's their not, money. It's not just 
It's not just that, but you you have to keep in mind that welfare is simply a way of appeasing the masses. It's 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 bread in the circus. So long as people have money, they can buy food. If they can buy food, they're going to be at least relatively calm. The second they can't buy food, you're in trouble. So it's entirely in the government's prerogative to just keep printing money and keep throwing it at people. It doesn't so, matter. Just so, when you, money. so when your average loaf of bread costs a £1,000, do you think the welfare state will continue? Yes. And the welfare state will be the last thing to go because the entire system is based around it. And do you think it, the welfare state is a massive contribution towards uh, mass migration into the UK? In as much as it attracts people to this country? Yes. Yes, that, that goes without saying. So do you think that's why the welfare state will not be abolished until last? No. No, it won't be abolished because it simply cannot be abolished until last. Because the, if you abolish it too soon, everything will fall apart. And there's, also, there's, there's no <coughs> incentive whatsoever for any politician to advocate for its abolishment. Do you think the government, so it's not going to happen. Do you think the government would be worried um, that if they abolished welfare, if people really... For all people claim that they've, they go without food, we, we've seen some... <laughs> rather obese people who claim they've gone without food to feed, the, feed their children. If people were genuinely going without food, if they had to choose which person ate in their family, mm -hmm. the government has been very, very careful to ensure that fights and arguments and disagreements happen within communities or between communities. But it's never really turned on the government as yet because the welfare state exists, right? Exactly. If you don't bite the hand that feeds you. So if the welfare state was abolished, of course all these people would turn on the government, yes? Mm -hmm. Which and is why it will never go anywhere. Not until everything else has collapsed around it. So do you think that they would sacrifice everything else to keep the welfare state going? Yes, of course. The, the welfare state is everything. We've seen this already. And it, protect the NHS. And is that part of protecting the government? Or is that part of um, fostering this idea that the state provides for you? Trust the state. Both. Although it isn't so much protecting the government, it is protecting the establishment. Because ultimately they could not care one jot less what sort of government there is, so long as the civil service remains, so long as the establishment remains there, they're content. It's irrelevant to them whether we have a democracy, whether we have a the, some sort of communist dictator, it's completely <laughs> irrelevant. They, they simply want to remain in power. So long as they do that, they're content. Well, Boris, the dictator, certainly doesn't think we're a democracy <laughs> anymore, I'm sure. Um, if, you, if, you were to, um, if you were to take power today, I, I love this little fantasy game, uh, what would be the first thing you would abolish? And, and in doing so, what would you put in place so that people were able to find alternatives. Would it be welfare? Um, mm. Mm, that's a question, isn't it? It is, because you can't <clears throat> take away one thing without taking away the the barriers that it puts up. Okay, so what like, would be... It's the... a wonderful fantasy just to go along and get rid of welfare, but unfortunately you've then got all those lost opportunities that people right. have. So, so, so let's say to... hypothetically you did abolish welfare. You're in government, you've been voted right, in today. Hi hypothetically, what I would do would be just scrap all of the laws around business. Just deal with that all the time, all of that nonsense. Just get rid of it. So anyone can open a business <clears throat> and they can trade anywhere, right, yeah, from just... their own home even. It, exactly. Do that, get rid of everything, and then... A couple of years later, get rid of welfare. Because there will still be some income loss. There will be debt racked up to your eyeballs, but debt obviously doesn't matter, so who cares? <laughs> you would just get rid of the, the main impediment, which is the the laws and the, the taxes around business. Get rid of all of those. And then a couple of years later, get rid of the, the welfare. And give everyone the opportunity the around, to earn for themselves. Exactly. You, you you give people the opportunity to, to do the best they can. And you also give the, the market time to adjust. That's the most important thing. Give the market time to adjust, allow people to go out and work, 
sort things out and then get rid of the, the safety net. I would love to see more people working from home uh, without all the um, hindrances, let's say. Um, it, it's really important that people are able to work from home as self-employed. Mm-hmm. Um, there are lots I think of... that, that in and of itself is a topic that we should cover more, much yeah. more. Yeah, because obviously there's a reason that people don't. Um, starting up small businesses, um, it's all about cost initially, and it's damn hard for anyone to get started if they don't have a little bit of money to play with um setting up a bank account you register the business um because you are restricted on what you can do in your home for you know domestic uh the noise restrictions domestic use um if 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 people were able to set up workshops in their home i mean my granddad had a workshop in his home but that's like the 1970s. That was when things weren't so restricted as they are. He lived the dream. He did live the dream. Um, I in, would love a workshop. In, in the case of researching for um, something earlier on this year, uh, I looked into all the things you need a licence for, and the list is amazing. Uh, literally everything needs a licence, even fishing. Mm-hmm. But if you had a lake... Or, or you collectively had access to a lake, you could just pay the owner of the land for access to fish. That's a private... Um, what's the word I'm thinking of? Private exchange. That's the one. I don't know if you need a licence to fish on private land. I know you need a licence to... There's a fishing season as well. Uh, yeah, seasons make sense. There's nothing wrong with that. That is fine, yeah. That I'm okay with. But still, the restrictions inherent in literally everything... Um, and, and the other thing that government interfere with, of course, is ownership. And we've talked about this before, and, and this is what I want to finish on. Um, going back to welfare, um, there's very little that you own, uh, welfare or not. We were talking about cars before and the registered keeper. Um, in the grand scheme of things, if the government were to flex their muscles, what does that mean to be a registered keeper rather than an owner? Okay, that made no sense. There's nothing to do with No, no, no. I, I know what you meant. It, it means you you are... The caretaker. Yeah, exactly. You're the caretaker of the vehicle. Nothing else. You don't own it. It's not yours. They can take it at will. That's it. And what do you think that people think... Um, there's this kind of stigma attached to welfare, isn't there? That people on welfare shouldn't smoke or drink or have cars. Um, I can understand the point of view from taxpayers that people on welfare should not be better off than they are for working. Mm-hmm. Do you think that we maybe need it to change our attitude towards work with regard to, um, well, first of all, two parents working, working outside of the home? Um, do you think if everyone was free to just do as they wanted, work-related, that there would be less resentment maybe from those who are propping up those who can't? Are those who can are propping up those who can't, or those who won't, which is a whole another topic. Possible. I'll have to think more about that. I I can understand that people who are working hard. It it really comes back to taxes, doesn't it? Taxes pay welfare. Taxes are taken by force. You don't have any choice about paying taxes. And you also don't have any um, choice as to where they are spent or on whom they are spent. Um, I I really need to bring this up, my bugbear, sugar tax. We already pay massive VAT on goods and the sugar tax. A few people have made the rest of us pay extra for things that we regard as a treat. Um, This all comes back to not just the welfare state, but the government essentially... The nanny state ism, I suppose, of the government. Uh, if the government were to remove its beak from our business, I think people would be um, more like entrepreneurs, I think, and less like, I hate this word, recipients. Or a state benefit recipient. It's like you've been written off, that you're no good for anything and that you that all you can do is claim benefits. 
Um, I think people are way more empowered than they've been led to believe. Or at least Absolutely. the power resides inside them. You've been convinced that you're a, a societal write-off. You've been convinced that you're good for nothing. And that you need everyone else to lift you up because you aren't capable of doing these things by yourself. But I agree with you here, Jordan, on this. <coughs> and that is, if there were less red tape, I think a lot of people would surprise themselves and others by just getting on with it, making things, building things, creating things, providing services that they possibly didn't even know they were capable of if they were just forced, yes, I'm going to say forced, to think outside the box. I, I don't even think it's a case of being forced. I think it is a case of being allowed. Or encouraged. I think, I th not even encouraged. It, people are able to do what they think they can do and actually act on what they want to do, <coughs> rather mm. than be held back by complete and utter nonsense. Well, like people, 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 people are afraid to learn to a trade, a aren't they? A lot. a lot of people are afraid to go to college or um, undertake a course because they're afraid that their benefits will get stopped or restricted or mm -hmm. reduced uh, because they're spending time that they should be looking for work for learning. Um, I've seen this loads of times in the past, um, actually, where people have been prevented from learning a trade because they're in receipt of benefits. And this learning is impacting on their ability to look for work. Does a government actually want you to better yourself and um, enhance your skills so that you're more employable or not? Because the way they behave, it would seem not. They want you compliant and reliant and apathetic and accepting of your lot in life in my that, opinion it's not to their advantage for you to be competent they want you to be incompetent because if you're incompetent you're going to ask them for help yes that's exactly. what this comes down to and it's not a case of people who are currently asking them for help being incompetent it is simply they've been convinced that yeah if they are competent, that help is withdrawn. But there's there, then that creates a void. There's, there's a void where there's no help while you're gaining competence in something else. Mm -hmm. um, I, I really do think we need to get back to, if you're going to rely on welfare, treat it as the short-term safety net it's supposed to be and not a lifestyle choice. If we have communities, if we embrace the idea of community and if we work to enhance our communities... Those people within it who are state dependent can be helped to get off of it. I, I see it much like a drug and they're addicted. Help them to wean off it and help yourself to wean off it. The state is not the be all and end all. It's reliant on you feeling that you're weak and incapable of making good decisions for yourself. What you need is a supportive community that will help you to um, embrace those decisions and try things. And if only you have the freedom to do those things, right? Mm -hmm. Any kind of handout that's conditional upon you not trying other things is pretty damn sinister. Anyway, I think that's a good note to wrap up on. Yes, there you go. The sinister state, everyone. Um, what would you do if there was no welfare? Uh, we'd love to hear your comments or read your no comments. No welfare and no government getting in the way. Yeah, so no restrictions, no welfare. What could you do? Let's, let's have some examples of the things you could do. Yeah, leave the comments down below and we'll cover them probably tomorrow, to be honest. Yeah, we'd, we'd love to, to hear what you have to think or read what you have to think. So... Yes, there you go. So the downside of welfare, uh, as always, is government interference. Um, we yearn for a time when there's no government in interference, and we know that you agree with us. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yes, we welcome those comments. We look forward to reading them. And uh, that's it from us. So we're going to say good night, and we'll see you tomorrow. Take care, everyone. Indeed. See you then. Bye for now.